Hello, I'm Rachel De Guzman, producer of engagement programs at Jiva Theater Center here today for the pre-recorded prologue for Sister Act. I'm here with Dr. Monica Weiss, who is a retired English professor at Nazareth College. And we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the themes, especially about the religious community in which Dolores Van Cartier, the um, protagonist in Sister Act finds herself hiding away from the mob. So recently there was a book that was published by Dr. Shannon D. Williams called Subversive Habits. And she really chronicles um, one, the history of black Catholic nuns in the United States and I guess the world too. And there was one quote that I wanted to start this conversation with just because this conversation is not about the book, but it's about the whole idea of being a fish out of water. And that's the theme of this play. And it, in what ways was um, Dolores Van Cartier, aside from the fact that she wasn't really a nun, in what ways was she a fish out of water in the convent in, in the play? And in the movie that came out in 1991, she was a fish out of water because of her race and because of her background as a lounge singer. Um, I don't know if you knew, um, Monica, that the original person that they had to play, um, Dolores, that wasn't her name, but the sister in Sister Act was Bette Midler. Oh no, didn't know that. And that was what the original writer really had. It, he had her in mind when he wrote the play or the music. Mm -hmm. And so when she decided not to participate because she thought it would hurt her brand to be seen in, um, a habit and just she just did not think it was good for her career. Whoopi Goldberg was cast and um, they had to quickly change the script to um, accommodate the fact that she was a black woman too, not just the lounge singer in, um, the, in the movie. And so that added a whole nother dynamic, whether or not it was um, done well or not is uh, you know, according to the, the person who saw it, but it was a big hit. And I just want to quote um, Kim Westerman from the Carondelet. Carondelet, is that, am I pronouncing that correct? Carondelet. Carondelet. And that's um, from St. Louis. She said that recent calls for the Catholic Church to confront and make reparation for its not long standing histories with slavery and segregation have met with shock and confusion. And I think in the article, she was referencing the case with Georgetown University in 2016. Probably. And she went on to say, Dr. Williams recently presented research on the experiences of black Catholic sisters in the United States for province assemblies in St. Louis and Albany. It is a story of grace, of perseverance, uncommon faithfulness in the face of unholy discrimination. She quoted Dr. Williams, who said, I tend to tell people that it's a story of America's real sister act, generations of African-American women who were called to religious life and fought against slavery and segregation to answer God's call in their lives and serve in the church in their church. But in the article, she also cites Barbara Moore, CSJ, the first African-American sister of St. Joseph in their um, congregation who said, I've been blessed in having strong and supportive women in leadership positions during my entrance in community formation and ministries. Also, most of the young women with whom I entered were gracious and kind. I am aware that some of the professed sisters had reservations about my entering. However, none ever confronted me personally, nor was I aware of any overt discrimination. She found additional support through support in local and national organizations for black Catholics, she said. My membership in these organizations has been supported throughout my years. Um, I don't have a particular question about the article, but I thought that since this is a fish out of water story and since this um, book, Subversive Nuns just came out in April and the director of the film is updating, I mean, the director of the, the play at Jiva is updating the script to include um, more complexity in her story. I thought I'd start with that and just 
throw that out to you. I know we had a conversation before we started recording where you had something you wanted to share about your experience and knowledge about um, the play. You read the play, but also this whole idea of um, being a fish out of water and maybe in terms of race specifically um, with this character. I mean, I'm not asking you to be an expert on it, but just to give some perspective. Okay, thanks. Uh, one of the things we had talked about is that this uh, story is about more than race. It's not only about race, and it's about all of the contrasts of different contexts which are going on in the story. And uh, while it's funny and humorous, let me just put in a little word here, it's rollicking entertainment, but and might be seen as being, oh, slightly irreverent but there's no cruelty or vindictiveness or spitefulness uh, in the jabs that are made uh, to the monastery, the convent or Catholicism. And the characters in there are following stereotypes. But the contrasts that I see are uh, bigger than just black and white. You've got the world of gangs at the beginning of this story. And then they're up against this convent. And one of the lines in there is when they say, well, our habits date back to the 14th century. Well, also does their spiritual practice date back to the 14th century? And they're kind of living a template life of rituals and their uh, prayers and hymns are in Latin. So you've got the world of gangs and this convent. And there are all these anachronisms that are going, it's Philadelphia, the 14th century convent. You've got the club singer and the nuns that are singing and chant, uh, all of this going on. And uh, I was interested when I was reading the script to be looking at this uh, in terms of rhetoric, of the language and how it changes uh, in the course of the play. And that maybe is something that people could be listening to. Uh, the British linguists talk about registers or codes in our language that reflect the socioeconomic culture that we are in. Uh, for example, if you want to be a dock worker, then talk like a dock worker. And uh, the thugs in this play use usually one syllable words and grunts and a few swear words thrown in. Uh, and that's their code or the register that they're comfortable in. Uh, or the stereotype of their code, I guess. The stereotype. I'm, not sure that sure. That, I'm not sure that that's an accurate depiction of, okay. <laughs> even the whole concept of thugs seems to be, yeah, very, um, a bit problematic. Well, and the play is full of stereotypes uh, in here. Uh, you've got, you've got a kind of a sidekicks, you've got Hookers. You've got the Keystone cops going through this whole thing with the chase scenes uh, that are uh, hilarious that are going on. Uh, what I was interested in, too, with the language was that Dolores is a kind of bridge between uh, the language of the crime scene of the guys that she hangs out with and the sisters who have holy thoughts and their language is more not just one syllable words, but longer. And uh, they're singing their laudat muste and benedici muste and all of this in, in Latin. When Dolores is at the Christmas dinner, she mixes up the prayers. She starts with the traditional prayers and then she moves off into some of our, our national uh, documents because she it's all all in all a mix for her. But when we get she also the, was educated in a Catholic school, so maybe she was yeah. She's got parts of it. <laughs> Maybe she was. She had gotten American history and her <laughs> religious education mixed up, and that's wonderful because by the time you get to the end and the end song, you've got this world of the characters outside the convent uh, and the characters inside the convent, and Dolores is singing about spreading the love, and they're all singing in harmony. And it all works so that it's sort of the language moves into not just musical harmony, but the language they all understand each other by the time they get to that final song. So I was thinking about in the beginning when she's singing, pray to sweep me away. Uh, 
as a lounge singer, there's a double entendre there, but those words come back at the end too. And it now has a spiritual level of significance to it. So uh, that fish out of water metaphor you were talking about, I think we see it in our own life. Uh, if you go to a new job, you have to look around to uh, assess what is the culture. And if it is uh, informal business attire for Friday, the question is, do you wear sandals or not? Uh, we saw it in our own city a couple of weeks ago when there was an uh, activist movement uh, downtown over the gun violence that we have experienced to come and sit Shiva in our downtown park. And I'm sure that many of the people that chose to do that, for them, it was a new culture, a new experience with the Jewish community to sit Shiva. So this is all part of our life. We're constantly moving into new uh, situations, it seems to me, uh, and, and feel strange that we're a fish out of water sometimes. But uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, I was thinking of a quote of Thomas Merton from New Seeds of Contemplation. Uh, Thomas Merton is a tra Trappist monk in the 20th century, probably the most influential spiritual writer of the 20th century, who said every moment and every event of every man's life, now we know this means human life on earth, plants something in his soul. So I think this uh, uh, also is a play about planting seeds and those seeds come to fruition uh, at one level at the end of the play as it moves into the finale and the harmony and the joy and the mojo that gets uh, expressed because Dolores can be the catalyst as a musician. She's able to call that forth from the sisters who seem to be uh, a rather drab, dreary bunch uh, in the beginning, seems to me, but she's able to uh, activate that spark that's within them. But I talked for a long time there. So you may want to move the conversation in a different direction or chat about something else here. When I was talking, when we've been talking, I've just been thinking about my Catholic education. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, you know, in the 70s and 80s, and it seemed a lot of the, you know, and of course I was with the sisters. Um, I was in Immaculate Heart of Mary and Sister um, in Mercy High School in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And um, I had guitar playing um, sisters who really did not. And I didn't have many, there weren't many sisters left, frankly, in either of those spaces. So I had a lot of lay teachers who also taught me in those Catholic schools. And so to a certain extent, it's it did not, it felt, even though it happened after the play and the movie came out after I was in those schools, it felt like a from an older time. But I know that there are other like the sis. Um, there were other schools in Detroit that had more traditional. Um, yeah, but but not the schools that I attended. So it, it did feel a little out of out of um, sync for me, as someone who um, you know grew up Catholic, going to Catholic schools. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So one of the early lines in the play uh, that I think Dolores says when she's whining about wanting a job as a singer is everybody is getting discovered. And I think that's happening in the play also. Dolores is discovering, well, Dolores is getting discovered as being uh, in the witness protection program and stashed in the convent. And so they got to find her. But I think each of the characters in there is discovering something about him or herself. And that that's probably, uh, I would say the most important thing about education and probably going back to your education, Rachel, uh, in school would be no matter what it was you were studying or what that experience was like, that the sisters and the administrators in that school were helping you to come to your full self. I think that, that was, was true, certainly at Mercy. And, I, and that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I, I selected it from two choices that my parents, they only gave me two choices. And one was a much more traditional, um, and it was more actually like a finishing school. 
Mm -hmm. The Sisters of Mercy were very challenging. I mean, our, our curriculum was very challenging. It was something that spoke to me at the time. Um, but when you were talking about, we talked before about rubbing elbows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? How people grew through rubbing elbows? That that's yes. those encounters and how you can learn from people, not just about other people, but about yourself through your encounters with other people. Could you talk a little bit more about what you meant there? Well, as they, uh, when I was talking in terms of the language or the, the codes that they speak that they're comfortable with, when they move into another context, they're rubbing elbows with somebody else and they don't always understand. For example, Dolores at the Christmas dinner or she makes a lot of gaffes uh, about stuff and the sisters make gaffes too when they say, oh, she's a sister from Africa. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Not recognizing that it's okay to be a sister who happens also to be black. Uh, there are other, other uh, rubbing elbows that, that maybe doesn't work when the Philadelphia Inquirer, after they've gotten their music together uh, and uh, they're raising money to save the parish, the Philadelphia Inquirer says, if you see only one mass, let it be this one. That sentence just jumped out at me. To you don't see mass, That's you attend true. mass, you participate oh. in mass, you celebrate mass, but you don't see mass. So they were and, treating it as an, a, a performance. Yeah, yeah. And so that seemed to me to be the, uh, let's say what, the typical innocent, naive, uh, secular observation about what was really going on within uh, Christian liturgy. Uh, but you know, there we are. Uh, another, another time in the play, uh, the mother superior says and defends Dolores when the enemy <laughs> comes in and says, she's not a nun. And sure enough, the mother superior has changed from being a pretty straight laced, tough lady into being, she is a sister. She has seeing that Dolores is no longer in this liminal space between these two different cultures, the lounge singer culture and the convent culture, but she's been included and accepted and there's a recognition of her talent. I think there's good rubble, rubbing of elbows right there between the mother superior and Dolores. And even, I love this line, they talk about uh, after after Dolores leaves, the mother superior says, uh, would she visit after the Pope gig? Because they're going to sing for the Pope. Now, Pope gig, the mother superior saying that, she's changed. There's some transformation that's gone on here, not just in Dolores, but also in all of the people that she has rubbed elbows with. And uh, Dolores is able to say another great line near the end that I think shows this rubbing elbows. She says uh, that the sisters sing with her and when she moves them up a half step in harmony, they all move with her. To which uh, the mother superior says, uh, well, that's God. And Dolores says, no, that's being human. And then the mother superior says, and one day we'll realize it's both. And that's a very key thing about a transformation that has happened in seeing the spiritual and the human is all one. It's not separate. There's not this dualism of living life and then, okay, now we're gonna pray and be spiritual. Uh-uh, it's all one involved thing. And if there's anything that uh, the show can teach us, I think we should take something away from it. It's rollicking entertainment as I said before, but there's also more than that going on. And I think it has something to do with the, the, the joy that gets released with the wonderful music and wild lyrics that are going on in there. And the singing in harmony, but also the harmony that comes between and among the people that are there. Uh, do you wanna jump in on that? I, well, I was gonna say that, um... Well, I'm here to hear mainly, you're the, you're the expert on this. Um, but I, I, what I got from what you were just saying is that spirituality is not performative either. I mean, and I think that that's, you know, there are aspects of, of, um, 
of spiritual ritual mm -hmm. that is performative, but it's not, but be the spiritual connection to God is not a performative right. thing. And so that's where that's where they can come together from both sides and understanding. Yeah, if it's merely performative, it's empty. Mm -hmm. And this is not. They realize that and they're they're uh, they're each changed by the time they get to the end of the show right? and experience in their life. How do you think that being in a religious community that didn't have a lot of um, connectivity to the outside world helped foster that kind of growth? You know, and fast tracked. Of course, this is you know a fictional play, but just from let's let's put ourselves in the play and believe everything mm -hmm. that happened. How do you think that happened? Because I think if they were encountering a whole lot of outside people, then it would have been harder for them to actually come together. Uh, probably. When Dolores says she's hungry and they tell her that there's a bar across the street and a couple of the sisters go with her, that's a whole new uh, venue for the sisters. And of course they make mistakes and don't know what they're supposed to order or ask for and they don't have any money. And of course somebody comes along to take care of the good sister and then they want some money for the jukebox and somebody else has a nickel or a quarter and they'll take care of that for the good sisters. But that's some opening into some more possibilities for, for the sisters to be thinking about. So, uh, then when they start singing also the, 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 the lyrics that they're singing, they're, those different from the invocations from the Gloria, a particular hymn at the beginning of mass, which has in it laudamus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, uh, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you. Those are the, uh, the uh, translation of that. Now I think I lost my train. Tell me. Well, I just, I think, you know, when you said that, um, if you go back into the history of the church and just the, in the, of, of when um, mass started being said in English, you know, and in other languages, I think that that, it made it more accessible to a lot more people. I think that, so maybe that language, like you said, the, the, the marrying of language, the, the opening up to each other, both being fish out of water because as you said when they went when the sisters went over to the bar they were the fish out of water in that particular aspect so i think that the kind of process in the in discomfort that they all um embraced or at least worked their way through helped them to then um be accessible, be um, open to each other. And mm -hmm. so I think that the whole idea of being, having um, access points mm -hmm. and not, um, I think that that was a, a big lesson in this play to be, you know, be really when uh, uh, the enemy comes looking for Dolores and Curtis is there and everybody's running around, the sisters work together to uh, hide her and uh, even sister, I think it's sister Mary Martin of Tours, who's in her own world. She's on her tour all the time. Uh, she knows Spanish and she's able to talk to Pablo and get him to give her his gun, which she doesn't shoot, but she takes and bops him over the head. So there's a way in which they uh, respond to the now moment. And I think that's the key factor for religious congregations to say, what read the signs of the time and what are the ways in which we can serve, that we can be a positive influence. Uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph, of whom I'm a member, talk about linking neighbor to God and neighbor to neighbor. And I think you see that happening in this play, uh, not maybe uh, ostensibly, but it's happening subtly, that that's what's going on, uh, that kind of, of opening up and in inclusivity with other people, letting them into your space and allowing the spirituality of your space to be uh, accessible to somebody else also. Had you seen the movie before? 
Yes, I had, that was quite a while ago. And uh, I'm sure it was Maggie Smith playing the very stirring Mother Superior. And it was just wonderful to see that. It's, she was practicing for her dowager role in Downton Abbey, maybe. The reason I was asking is because I wondered how, having seen it before and then reading mm -hmm. the play now, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a world of, the world has changed and moved forward and moved backwards and everything since then. I wonder yeah. how it hit you reading it now compared well, to when you saw the um, movie years ago. Well, it's, it's the humor and irreverence of uh, some old traditions, but it's not done with any, as I said, with any vindictiveness. And so you just roll with it and smile and laugh and say, yeah, that's the way it used to be. But, you know, that's not what's important. What's important is being spiritually present to the now moment and who is in need right now and how can you best reflect God's presence in the world. Mm -hmm.